Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew, where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, thank you so much for spending your time here listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, I'm really looking forward to you guys diving into this interview today. Uh, I had such a great time uh, talking with our guest, uh, who is none other than Rob Turner, the drummer for the band Go Go Penguin. Now, if you haven't checked out Go Go Penguin, please jump online, check their music out. It's absolutely beautiful, stunning, uh, and I know that you're going to love it. Um, I, I kind of got into their music uh, pretty recently, a few months ago, and uh, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a conversation with uh, with this band? And, and then uh, Rob Turner put up his hand, and I'm so glad that he did, uh, because, man, we have such a fascinating conversation uh, talking about, you know, even as far back as Pythagoras and Plato and what they were doing with music. Uh, we talk a bit about Miles Davis, we talk a bit about philosophy, a bit about music, uh, but I, I just I know that you guys are going to find this really interesting uh, because you know I, I know that often we can kind of um, you know separate the worlds of philosophy, the wisdom tradition uh, and and say music and art and culture and all this sort of stuff but but what I have found this year uh, as I have been rediscovering my own uh, I guess uh, you could say my own philosophical, uh, uh, direction. Um, I found more and more that I really want to be looking at culture and music and and art uh, as much as possible in order to uh, I- enhance my own philosophical uh, journey, you might say. And likewise, uh, you know, really looking at philosophy to enhance my music, and it has done that so far this year. It's been absolutely, um, yeah, you know, mind blowing for me. So. I should definitely tell you a little bit more about Rob and the band before we jump in. So, uh, Rob Turner is a musician from Manchester, UK, and is the drummer and co-writer of the band, as I previously mentioned, Go Go Penguin. Uh, The band is known for expanding the piano trio format, combining elements of traditional styles, such as jazz and classical, with modern electronic music, which they perform live on acoustic instruments. His work with the band has included five studio albums, two released by Manchester's Godwana Records, uh, the second of which received the coveted Mercury Prize shortlist in 2014, and three albums released by the legendary Blue Note record label. With Gogo Penguin, Rob composed As Above, So Below, a hermetic-influenced tribute to the work of Basil Kirchin, commissioned by the Performing Rights Society Foundation. Also, he composed a live ballet performed at the Barbican, and also a live rescoring of Godfrey Reggio's cult masterpiece, Koyaanisqatsi. In addition to performing around the globe, the band have also appeared on NPR's Tiny Desk series, Jules Holland, and together with co-member and bassist Nick Blacker, Rob has presented on Gills Peterson's Worldwide FM radio. So I'm sure you'll agree the band has quite the resume uh, as well as Rob, but uh, their music is even better. So make sure you check it out. There's going to be links in the show notes to where you can get that. And the final thing that I want to mention before we jump into the interview, I think I must have been wearing noise-canceling headphones during this interview because I'm basically screaming into the microphone and I apologize for that. Uh, So uh, without any further ado, uh, I present to you my interview with Rob Turner from Go Go Penguin. So, yeah, I, I want to give you the opportunity just for, for my audience who might not be kind of aware of Go Go Penguin. Um, if you just want to kind of introduce yourself um, and then tell the story of Go Go Penguin, how it came to be, what you guys are up to now. Okay, sure. So my name's Rob. I'm uh, the drummer in a band called Go Go Penguin, which is 
like a, a jazz trio, I guess. There's an, an acoustic bass, there's a piano and there's a drum kit. Um, but we're from Manchester in England and we're, you know, influenced by lots of different music. We all studied classical music and jazz music and really interested in electronic music. So we kind of um, put all this together when we started making music. We, uh, we were really fortunate. We got nominated for a Mercury Prize in 2014. And from the back of that, we've been able to tour around the world. And um, we signed to um, a label called Blue Note, which is really respected jazz label. And yeah, we, we just, we play music that's a bit electronic and a bit jazz. Mm. Yeah, I love it, man. And and that that's the cool thing for people at home kind of who are listening to this show. Uh, you know, when when you hear the word jazz, a lot of people, uh, probably including myself subconsciously, you immediately think of people like Louis Armstrong. You might think, uh, you know, a lot of people are just going to think Michael Bublé. They're going to think Frank Sinatra, right? <laughs> but, yeah. um, but, you know, I think what's so cool about the music industry now and the jazz scene is that we have so many, like, cool uh, cool bands coming up, especially like, like Go-Go Penguin, really fusing uh fusing classical jazz electronic you know different instrumentation like uh, what you guys are doing is so cool and and you know I, I, one thing that i particularly love um there's also to me it seems like there's almost like a me, like a is meditatory a word like meditation kind of aspect to when i'm listening to your music because there's a lot of stuff that you guys do that is kind of repetitive but man it's so good it's so good cool. like the um the the sounds that you guys are making um and and it just um you know I, I originally got onto you guys by listening to i think it was like a kind of um classical fusion kind of apple playlist and right. one of your tunes came up and i was just like damn who who are these guys right so um i want to ask as well uh, how did the name Go Go Penguin come up? This might be like yeah. a psychedelic story or something. <laughs> but, uh... You know, not at all. I, it's actually <laughs> quite, quite boring. I mean, what happened was, um, yeah, we were making music uh, just in the front living room of this house, right? Um, and we weren't intending to perform it <clears throat> to anyone. We just were experimenting and trying to make some music that we wanted to listen to ourselves. And then uh, one of my friends called up and, and said, oh, you know, the band that was supposed to play tonight can't come. Their car's broken down or whatever. Have you got anything that you can do like in, you know, two hours, come down and do a gig? So it's like, well, yeah, we can do this band. And then we thought, well, we need a name. Um, and then there was a penguin, like a stuffed penguin in the room. So I think someone said, I'll call it Penguin. And then we say, well, I can't just call it Penguin. So then we say, oh, let's call it Go Go Penguin. And that was it. Yeah. So it was, the, it was, the attention was just to like make it, you know, not the kind of like, you know, Chris Illingworth trio, the Rob Turner trio, like sort of get away from that, that thing. So it's just to give it something that's so irrelevant, you know, um, that that was the point really and yeah it worked out quite well for us but i think that's quite common with great all great bands you know like on the surface of it like the beatles isn't a good band name uh, neither is radiohead you know but then mm -hmm. the music uh the music kind of dictates the name somehow you know mm. so when you when you hear radiohead you're like, yeah you have an emotional response to that um which yeah. is not anything to do with the quality of the band name yeah Man, that story is, that just makes me think of every musician documentary I've ever <laughs> seen. It's like, you see stories like that all the time where it's like, oh man, I bet they thought for like days and days about that name. Nope. It was just like a random gig, yeah, yeah. pick a name and it's, it's a sick name. It's awesome. You know, it's great. So congratulations on that, that uh, yeah. this beautiful story. Um, so in terms of developing your style, um, I want to know, because we've already kind of been talking before the interview, obviously, uh, mm. but 
you've got a few thoughts about kind of how you kind of developed your own sound. I think that often this kind of discussion can lead to really important uh, philosophical implications as well for how you can kind of start to think like, like an individual in life as well. Like how did you guys develop the sound that you have the style and everything like that? Sure. I mean, we all, we'd all studied a lot of music and played a lot of music. Um, exposed to a lot of music we played a lot of music we didn't want to play we played a lot of music that we did want to play um and then we just it it was relatively simple in that we liked this band called est and espion svensson trio they were a scandinavian piano trio that did a lot to expand um what a standard jazz what you expect a jazz trio to sound like you know so if you think of it like a jazz piano trio, probably like Bill Evans trio, the Paul, you know, some of the Paul motion. I, I mean, it's quite specific, but uh, you, you have an idea of what a jazz piano trio is. And then Espion Svensson really expanded that. And we were inspired by that, but we also just really loved a lot of electronic music. Chris loved Massive Attack. And, and so we just tried to, um put all this together just to see what it would sound like because we loved the the texture of the piano trio but we loved the energy and the music and the rhythms and kind of the abstractness of a lot of electronic music and we were fortunate in that we'd studied so much classical music that it was quite easy for us to do that um and so yeah we, we just did it for that purpose only for for ourselves we wanted to know what that would be like and then yeah as it went on other people liked it as well that's kind of as complicated as it got i think Mm, yeah yeah and and, you know i think i think that that's um i think that that is so like the process that we go through as individuals trying to figure out exactly kind of who we are how we think you know you kind of take bits and pieces from everywhere and, mm. you know, you, you know, we've, we were even talking kind of earlier about kind of ideology. I think a lot of people can get stuck in the ideology of music as well as they can, you know, as much as they can get stuck in the ideology of philosophy or, or you know, religion or all sorts of things. Cause you can kind of say, well, I'm a, this musician, or I'm a, that musician, you know, jazz sure. classical, but what you guys have done is said, no, no, no we're, we're not necessarily any of that. We're something completely different. Let's take a little bit from here. And, and that's like, may, maybe that says something about what really makes um, music effective or what makes music appealing to people when it's unique. It's like there's Mm. something different about it. It's not necessarily falling into any sort of category or bucket. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think one thing I noticed when I was younger, um, there's like a a tendency to to try and identify with a group. So... Mm. You know, you go through a, per- through a period where you'll wear um, makeup, get your ear pierced and listen only to goth music. And, and you know, I am a goth or I did, you know, I did that. And then I did a bit where I was like, put tracksuit bottoms on and, you know, hang around on bus stops and be a scally and listen to um, happy hardcore for some reason. I don't know why, why like Gabba became associated with, with <laughs> that. But, uh, and then it, you know, it kind of carries on to the point where, you know, you, you might be, uh, you know, within classical music, it, you know, it, it's actually quite a big, big identity to be superior, you know, smarter, more intelligent. Um, and so I sort of noticed all that. But then personally, I'd, I'd kind of applied this thing that that I thought of the, the most interesting thing about studying all these music. So, I, you know, I played in he- uh, heavy metal bands as a teenager. I played jazz music with 50 year old men in these bizarre jazz clubs and then I'd also you know performed like Oliver Messiaen with orchestras and and I was trying I thought well what's if I could find something that's the same in all of this that's useful information and that was kind of the way I'd looked at religions as well when I was like a teenager I got really interested in religion um and I was and they're so different, but I thought, well, is there anything that in all of them that's identical? And in that case, that might like take you somewhere really interesting. You know, if they all agree on on a few 
aspects like wow that that would be great you know so then within music i kind of adopted that attitude of trying to find what what all the music styles agree on rather than why they're different mm. um so that that really helped i think in writing music for go go penguin because you're not really trying to make any kind of particular style you're just genuinely like i i really like that sound so i'm gonna repeat it a hundred times <laughs> yeah and then yeah put a drum drum beat on it because i like the drums as well so yeah, yeah. and that's what's so cool right like it, we're, we're kind of talking about you know the similarities between the way you, you approach your music and the way you approach your life it's like um you know it's it's so interesting that you talk about kind of finding the similarities in religion because uh, earlier on in the year, I literally said on the podcast multiple times that one of the reasons why I'm coming back into philosophy in such a big way this year is to try and find those parts that are similar between Buddhism and Stoicism and Christianity and, you know, Islam sure. and, and trying to pull them all together um, mm. and it is, that's, that's the, the most interesting wisdom that you can find is those parts that just pop up everywhere. It, it's exactly. so unbelievably yeah. interesting. Um, and, and maybe we could kind of jump into the philosophical side of things as well. Cause I, I, we kind of discussed earlier, um, kind of going into like Pythagoras and early mm. Greek and Roman um, perceptions of music or creation of Western music as we know it. Um, I've been really fascinated by this lately, um, even thinking about how, you know, the, the 12 tones of our scale kind of mm. correlate with the 12 colors in a rainbow by the shades. Mm. And it's like, you, know, you look at that and you think, that's interesting. Why would that be the case? And then how it kind mm. of applies to say the Fibonacci sequence or, or, you know, Mandela's or, um, all this sort of stuff. And then, and then I learn about the, uh, the, um, oh my gosh, I can't even remember what it's called. The part inside the ear that actually has all of the, the cochlea cochlea. Yeah. There's yeah. a little spiral, right? <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, and I think yeah. about that. And then I, and then I think about um, the Disney movie, Hercules, how his ears are spirals in the movie. Sure. And I'm like, ah, oh, Disney got it, obviously. Um, yeah. But there's something so divine about music. And I think that they understood that back then. But tell me what you've understood in your research, because um, I want to know yeah, what you've so, kind of learned. I mean, I, I, was, I was trained as... Uh, I was trained as a squaddy in an orchestra to follow whatever the conductor told me to. That was, that's basically this, the, one of the skills that you acquire. Mm. And, and it also, you know, this, you study Bach, you study jazz theory. And if, to be honest, I was never good at it. I found it so challenging because it, it just never really made any sense to me. Mm. I was always confused why the scales started on C and not A, because even when I was like 10 doing my first music theory, I thought, why isn't it in alphabetical order? This is so difficult. And then you've got to learn all this complicated nomenclature and it's like, ah. Um, so after I finished university, I was none the wiser, to be honest. I, I think naively, I thought by the time I finished my degree, I would understand the meaning of God and all music. <laughs> and at the end, I didn't really know very much. Um, although fortunately, I was quite skilled at playing jazz because I had a really good drum teacher. Um, so yeah, I remember just sitting down with a piece of wood and some nails and a string and just starting from scratch. and repeating the experiment so you know i found about out about pythagoras probably from wikipedia or something i thought okay this is interesting so i started cutting strings up at different ratios and putting and plucking them to see what they sounded like and that 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 was really interesting that kind of it was so it's so frighteningly like it's such an obvious thing but when you when you really take it to heart that a string that is half the length of the other vibrates at twice the frequency and they become harmonious together. It's like mm. a rhythm that's perfectly quantized and locked in. That's a, you know, that has a lot of philosophical implications. And then, you know, the cycle of a waveform and how it's dissonant for a moment, how, and it's harmonious for a moment. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of how I, you know, very slowly started to understand music um the main goal of it all of it was to just to 
fathom what the hell Stockhausen was talking about because it's so advanced. You know, the, when you watch those lectures, which is, is all the philosophy and understanding of music that you could, I mean, it's, it's all there, but I didn't even understand the first sentence. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I had to learn all, all of this, you know. And uh, so and, Stockhausen, and, yeah. he, he's got a series of lectures. Where can you find those? Yeah, Stockhausen did some lectures in 1972 called the London Lectures. They're all on YouTube. And I mean, Stockhausen, it, he basically, he'd understood, oh God, I don't even know how to tell the story of Stockhausen. It's so <laughs> epic. Um, he he basically laid the foundation for every plausible creative avenue in music. Uh, he created synthesis. He, um, I mean, he's a controversial figure as well. Like all, mu- you know, these musical geniuses are. Um, there's just something a little bit, you know, Wagnerian about it, maybe. But he. Um, it's it's about looking at the physics and the mathematics of sound and how sound behaves. And these principles are really difficult to arc, articulate in language. It, it is something that you acquire from playing with sound. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's possibly, you know, what does make all the, all the Greek philosophy so challenging is it a, a lot of it is founded on playing around with music with with strings it's quite childlike it's physical in the world you know and it reveals things to you that yeah i i'm not someone who's able to articulate it in language yeah it's it's quite a personal understanding yeah it is but but you know on on another level it's what, if you put it into the right words, it's something that we can kind of all understand. Like something that I learned the other day was that Pythagoras actually believed, I, I might be wrong on this. I might've just watched the wrong YouTube lecture and <laughs> just got it completely wrong. But but Py- apparently Pythagoras actually believed that um, you could kind of come under the spell of poor tuning or, you know, like can, you, your body was out of tune to, to a bad scale almost. And he would come and yeah. he would play different music to a person. And, and then you see that was, verses. I think that was, that was Plato, Sorry, I think. Oh, Plato. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Pyth- Pythagoras basically creates what's called, um, is it the perfect immutable scale? So he, what, what he did is he, he creates, intervals of um they're called thirds in greek which makes it really difficult because a a third in like western harmony is this major sound but the thirds in the greek system probably are relating to the ratio of the strings which creates that sound yeah um so yeah that's mistake number one and that you know yeah that debate went on for a long time but he basically created these scales and what he was interested in is the fact that if you adjust these strings and their ratios mathematically, they create really nice sounding scales. Um, and that's, that just fascinated him later on. Cause I'm not even sure that Pythagoras was real, right? Some people call it a school. Some people say he's the man. Some people say he was Hermes Trismegistus or whatever. Mm. It doesn't really matter. The, the main point of it is that throughout that kind of 300, 400 years, by the time you get to Plato, Plato prescribes different tunings of lyres for different ailments. So mm. he has a scale for a broken heart. He has a scale for uh, allegedly he cured a man of his drunkenness by scale. And, and, what they didn't really refer to these things as scales like the scale means like ladder i think in greek Mm -hmm. and that's it's really difficult to know how they approach that but they they certainly played scales down not up like we're always taught to play um do re mi fa sol la ti do and that's another debate at how how that thing you know came about it's bizarre Mm. but they would play the scales down and they would tune this way and then they would fill the gaps in Uh, and you could then keep the same system but change just a couple of the tuning pegs 
Mm. And that has a different ethos, they called it, like an effect on your heart. Mm. Versus. And I think, I mean, a lot of the times they're using these in the plays as well. So it's kind of like early film music, but it was taken very, very seriously. And they had hundreds of these tunings, like so many more that we use now. Like the whole of um, the kind of Renaissance era is basically a massive argument of how to create a 12 tone system, which is yeah. just a, a, a really drawn out compromise. So it's yeah. really difficult to replicate all those things, but it's certainly taken really seriously. Like one of my favorite Greek stories is the story of Marcius, um, who plays the all, which is like a two double reed instruments that you play at the same time it's really challenging and he's like i mean this is not the way the story goes it's my interpretation of it but i'm a musician so i'm allowed artistic license <laughs> yeah yeah he but he's basically impressive right he, he's got this amazing technical ability on this instrument and people are just all inspired by it so he decides to challenge apollo to a music competition and they put a panel together to judge it and King Midas is there. So uh, Marcius plays first and he plays this amazing scales flying all over the place. It's fast, it's loud, everyone claps, everyone loves it. And then Apollo comes and Apollo plays the greater perfect immutable scale, which is pretty much the height of the kind of Pythagorean thinking, which contains all the ethos, all the emotions, all within one scale. And it reveals uh, the truth about uh, life, death, rebirth. It has um, all the secrets of nature and it has all the secrets of the mathematical principles and the workings of the stars and the universe. He plays this scale in his golden lyre. The birds fall silent and people start to cry with this like empathy at the, uh, at, you know, the, the beauty of existence and people are spontaneously enlightened or whatever. Um, so obviously he wins the competition, uh, but they'd made an agreement beforehand, which was the winner of the competition gets to do whatever they want to the loser. And I think that Marcius expected this to be some kind of sexual orgy where he maybe ends up with a half, half God, half human child of it or something. Uh, and instead, what Apollo does is he first takes King Midas. He was the only person to vote against Apollo because Midas couldn't perceive the wisdom in the scale. And he turns his ears into the ears of a donkey as a punishment. Marcius, on the other hand, is uh, taken to the top of the mountain and skinned alive. So the disparity between the punishments is quite, is the thing <laughs> that really hit me about that story, to be flayed alive. And so in the Renaissance, it's always about, um, you know, Marcius is punished because he, he challenges the gods or he's not penitent to the gods or his arrogance is hubris. But, my interpretation of the story is that it's more about the use of, of the, the wisdom of, Pythagore of Pythagoras, which is expressed in music, which I believe is how Plato finished most of his discourses when he was older. And it was the fact that he used that for, uh, in, a, in, a, in a quite a vulgar way. And he missed mm. the point of what music could teach, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Man, that's a badass story. I love that. That's so cool. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that we can, everybody can, when we think of Plato, everybody thinks of, you know, the, just the, the pinnacle of Western thought, you know, he's, he's, he's the man, you know, like he, all logical, you know, com completely rational, but then he's he's using music to kind of save people and and mm -hmm. you know then I think about things like um, I think about the connections where Nietzsche uh, actually says that Christianity is sort of like Platonism for the common person right and then you you read the Bible and you see verses in there where it's kind of talking about how 
you know, the king was vexed and then they brought the musician unto the king and, and he played and mm. the king was, was good again. And you think about that sort of stuff and, and it just makes you think, I have no idea what music is because they were, they were thinking about aesthetics. They were thinking about God. They were thinking about the universe. What is everything? Mm. Um, kind of makes you think that we don't even understand music one little bit <laughs> or what its potential is for, for truly sure. creating a harmonious uh, kind of uh, humankind. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think music therapy is a really interesting, like young discipline. Yeah. Uh, most obviously not that young if Plato was doing it two and a half thousand years but ago. But we're rediscovering but it now. We're, that we're kind of waking it. up yeah. from this hyper rational kind of, you know, materialistic sure. kind of view of the world. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder whether that's also partly just because we're, you know, clearly very Western. Um, I think, you know, in it, Indian classical music, it, it's not uncommon to to be like, oh, if you want to be enlightened, yeah, you know, just check out this scale and da 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 da. da you know, so I think like, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, it it is definitely out there. For for some reason, it has gone a bit wonky in the West. I would say like that. You know, may, maybe it's to do with like, dare I say it, capitalist ideology. Being, mm. and how but then i mean music is this like very flexible thing you know it, it 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 like no perspective on music is is wrong it it does have all of these forms it has this you know it can be used for spiritual enlightenment it can also be used to sell trainers it can be used to do all sorts of things it doesn't really have an inherent philosophy other than it you know it tends to like show you that everything just is as one uh, and you should approach your philosophy from that point of not trying to reject anything it it, it, it yeah it's it's tricky i mean again like yeah. the, the problem with music is um like someone said you know talking about music is like dancing about architecture mm. you know you're always creating these circular arguments and it's uh yeah it, it's really yeah it's really 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 challenging uh, yeah. But there's a lot of amazing research, you know, and, and I think that we will certainly learn more about the effect of music and sound on on mental health, you know, which mm. is ultimately what, what the ethos principle is about. You know, it's it's about help helping people when they have um difficult mindsets. Yeah. Yeah, man. And and I, I, you know, the, the thing is like, I've talked about this before on the show. We all know that, you know, when it comes to music, it's kind of like food for the mind, food for the soul, right? Like it's like whatever you feed yourself, you're going to kind of go down that direction of thinking and feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really think it's interesting to kind of, uh, to pay attention, to really kind of pay attention to how you feel. I've even talked about, you know, when I, when I watch advertisements now, you know, the past kind of the past year, I've really woken up to just how much I'm taken into a good advertisement. You know, how do I feel when they use this person at this moment with this color, with this music, you know, little jingle, I think that music is one of the best gateways, like you said, to kind of understanding that everything is connected, that, that your Mm. behavior is in no way unrelated to your external environment and the kind of, well, is it external? That's the thing because whatever is out there is flowing into you through your senses and it's creating everything. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's really, it's really clear that music will change your emotion and change your mental state, you know, otherwise they wouldn't use it in, in Hollywood films. You yeah. know, if you, I mean, if you're watching like yeah, Transformers or something, um, you're not really going to necessarily identify with like a really, you know, under de- underdeveloped robot character in some kind of like trash movie but when they when they uh you know hack a bit bit of Shostakovich and stick it behind that scene then you're immediately taken by that music right and obviously you're taken by that music because fundamentally that music was written under the oppressive 
hand of Joseph Stalin knocking at the door waiting to kill him. You know, it's yeah. These real events were put into this music. It, likewise, it, you know, deep struggles for freedom. Um, it, it, yeah, just so much like earthly experience that's kind of etched into these musical styles and, and musical traditions that, yeah, they, they clearly have. I mean, I don't know whether that's like Jungian or what, I, I don't know the mechanics behind that, but it's clearly evident, you know, there's no reason that you should feel, um, they, you know, they have this word in, in Japan, I think it's like wabi-sabi, which is like an emotion that's a poignant reflection on the ultimate impermanence of life, you know, like mm. that kind of tearful um, f- feeling, I don't, yeah. Uh, and there's no reason you should feel that when you're seeing an advert for Coca-Cola, right? <laughs> but sometimes yeah, yeah. you do. And <laughs> so sh- surely music is powerful, yeah. Yeah. And I think you make a really good point there that that the music is absolutely attached to the hand that it was written by, to the time period that it was written in. Like I, mm-hmm. I did this exercise a while ago because I've only recently started getting into classical music and classical crossover. But something that I was doing, I, I, I was going for, um, going for a run through some trails in these beautiful mountains near where I live. And I was thinking about the time period when the Catholic church was kind of commissioning all this music, especially from mm. people like Bach. And, mm. and I was thinking, okay, cool. Why don't I try and listen to the music from the perspective of what are they trying to get through in this music? Why did they want to create this? Why did Bach want mm. to write this? What was he being inspired by at the time? And I put this music on, um, I can't remember what it was, but it was um, just a solo violin piece. And I'm walking mm. through these mountains and I'm looking out and I'm just thinking, oh, when you think about the history when you think about the inspiration behind the music, when you think, what are they trying to teach me from this? You mm. can learn a whole lifetime of lessons just by listening and paying attention, right? To just pay, paying attention to what you think they're trying to say. Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's really hard to figure out that period in music history. Yeah. I, when I listen to Bach, sometimes I'm wondering whether, whether it's, it's, he's actually trying to understand God by researching sound and vibration, right? Mm. Because like that, that's, that's the constant that doesn't really change. But then, you know, there's the argument that Bach represents the period where um, there's like the human force of imposing tonal organization on the world because the world is naturally chaotic and therefore the human mind is there to create, what do they say? They to create order in the chaos of the universe. Yeah. And again, I mean, back it's like sixteen eighty-five to seventeen fifty, I think. So he's like sixty-five years of thinking within Bach's music. It's not just one idea. It's going to be a, a whole lifetimes of, of yeah. ideas. And I mean, he built organs. You know, like so he's the relationship of mathematics, of architecture and music and theology all mixed together. I mean, just the, the idea of building an organ is ridiculous. Like yeah. how, is, I, don't, I think I'd rather be challenged to try and get to the moon than tune yeah. an organ. <laughs> like, and then you look at the cathedral it, within which the organ yeah, is housed yeah. and you think, yeah. we don't create anything like that these days like we we don't even try to create the beauty and the the just you know you walk into a cathedral and you think okay i get it you know i get Mm. why people were so taken aback by by um this kind of religious thought it's like you walk into a place like this and you think how could there not be something bigger than myself when you're looking up at the stained glass windows and the the organ music and, you know, the choirs and something that I think about as well as, you know, we, we have so much access to free music now. I think that it kind of makes us not realize just how 
incredible the experience would have been for somebody 200 years ago, walking into a theater, paying a lot of money for it and being there to listen to this, you know, massive orchestra on stage playing something that you only get to hear once in a while, if that, right, if you're lucky enough to. Mm. And this is supposed to teach you about the, the, just how big and powerful everything is, right? I can't even imagine how amazing that would have been, especially in that time, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, going back to your point about about the church is funny because I every time I go into the church, I just feel really uncomfortable. And I think it's, <laughs> I always just think it's really creepy place, you know. Um, yeah, it's it, it sort of, how do I feel? Churches always make me feel kind of foggy. Like, yeah, it's, yeah that, that is, it's odd. It's, odd. Um, it's interesting. But yeah, trying to figure out how how and how you would respond to that music at the time is yeah it is really interesting to re- try and relate to that i mean i guess you, you just don't know you know you but don't know. I mean, there are definitely <laughs> yeah there's great uh i mean there's you know we definitely do make equally impressive things but from yeah different different perspective i guess yeah i mean yeah. i think that like we were talking earlier about miles davis and um the performance that he did in the 1970 at the Isle of Wight is one of my favorite pieces of music in in the world and and I think that to me that that is like you know a 20th century equivalent of the uh you know Saint Matthew Passion or something because Mm. it's such a philosophically complete uh performance and it's videoed so you can actually see it. You can get a taste of the atmosphere. You know, it's, I think it's the largest outdoor festival in history or something. He was performing after Jimi Hendrix and, you know, they just go out there and they, and they play this music and a guy says, Oh, what's this called? And he just says, call it anything. It's, it doesn't even have a title. Uh, and it's just the experience of creating music in the moment, you know, and that's something that's often overlooked uh in in bark definitely like i think he most of those pieces he could just play if he wanted at any time over any yeah. theme he would i mean it would just be astonishingly skilled and talented it's yeah amazing um but mm. i think the philosophy I, I can't Im- from i mean i'm not I, I i you know i'm not really on that sort of level with the you know the stockhausens and messions and all that at all Oh, Miles Davis for that matter, but I have played with music and I, I can't imagine that the the mindset is that different going back, you know. I think that musicians that were playing with uh, Pythagoras's Liars would be thinking about music in a very similar way. And, and, I, and it's funny to wonder whether a lot of these musicians were obsessively researching theology or whether they were just doing that because it was a gig you know yeah. and it was an opportunity like if you want to build an organ someone's got to pay for it uh, and it's probably a combination of all of that you know all mixed into this yes yeah, like live back 65 years you know you can't put that into a book it's just yeah just to be awed at and you know take take what you want from it i think yeah now and, and, and you know i think i think that what's so cool about what's interesting about the you mentioned the chaos and order kind of theory of, um, of what we're trying to do here. And obviously like the logos, we've kind of discussed this with Miles Davis. I kind of think he was the logos of jazz. You know, you, I think you kind of have, he said, um, and for the audience, you know, home Miles Davis is somebody who started out in jazz swing, big bands and ended up about to, you know, do a whole album with Jimi Hendrix. It's like, how do you go from that? Like unbelievable, but he actually said, you can tell the whole story of jazz uh, in four words, uh, Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker. Right. But I mm-hmm. think you have to add Miles Davis to that if you want the full picture. Right. Cause yeah, you've sure. got Louis Armstrong who is kind of the, he's like the father figure of jazz. You know, he's kind of like, and he didn't really like bebop. He thought it was going too far. He was kind of the protector yeah. of the old way of doing things. So you might call him order, you know, like, and then you've got Charlie Parker, who's kind of like the chaos. He comes along and he's like, nope, I'm going to push forward. And he just breaks the whole system. 
Now yeah. Miles was like, no, 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 we're not chaos. We're not order. I, I know this is so out of my realm. I shouldn't be saying this because <laughs> it's to, to paint a picture of Miles, I, I'm such an idiot. I shouldn't do it. But, but I think Miles was kind of like, no, 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 we're not chaos. We're not order. We are the process by which we constantly transform chaos into order, right? Where, the, where that sure. process of the logos of pushing forward and letting that signal flow through us, whatever the mm. signal is. Um, yeah. And well, don't you, don't you think that almost paints the picture of classical versus jazz as well or classical versus, sure. you know? Uh, I mean, my understanding of it is that, um, so when the Greeks talk about uh, daemon, or mm -hmm. uh, later, I think it's translated as genius Latin. What they, they were kind of referring to was like uh, unspeakable divinity manifesting creativity in the moment. So they yeah. don't really celebrate musicians because it, the, the human being that happens to be playing the lyre at the point at, the, at that time is irrelevant. What what's being revealed is the is the music itself, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can't say someone is a genius. You have to say someone is possessing of genius at that particular time. And that sort of, you know, that, that attitude is then interpreted by Bertius, who's actually quite an influential thinker on music. Uh, I think he's like 500-ish AD. He's a Roman politician, and he writes this book, which is basically trying to explain all of the Greek uh, theory he's definitely got most of it wrong because there's more recent research and that's a quite a big deal for the renaissance because they based all of their information on his book so it's like a bad mm. translation of a bad translation of a misunderstanding but he he writes this book where he kind of gets into this idea of like being quite dismissive of musicians which is quite common in that era like this sort of always picking on musicians specifically musicians that aren't intelligent enough enough to really appreciate the mathematics and the physics behind what they do so they hate people that just make music without thinking about it and most of my friends make music in that way i have a friend who deliberately has chosen not to know the names of the strings on a guitar because he doesn't well. want it to affect <laughs> his ear right um so they hate hate that and that's definitely the attitude that kind of carried on in, into classical music and, and and classical music theory. Through then, you get like you know the the, the Renaissance and all that you know the amazing music and theory and mathematics. But there's hundreds of people involved in that, thousands. I mean, I read a book recently by a guy called Adam von Fulda, which is written I think in about 1400, and he's like bemoaning how the Roman Catholics are taking German uh, hymns, no, German folk songs and turning them into hymns. So they're changing the lyrics to lyrics about, you know, the Bible or whatever. And he's trying to defend this, you know, German. It just got, it's, it's yeah. kind of epic. But when you get into America at the turn of the century, the, the biggest change I would suggest, but there's lots of, like everyone has a theory about how jazz evolved and they're all correct in their own ways. But the big thing that changes is that you get a, a really quite a powerful recording industry, a publishing industry, and you get commercialism in music and that changes everything, you know? Um, but the philosophy continues and, in, in, and Miles is basically trying to chase present moment awareness in a kind of, you know, the way that Eckhart Tolle would describe it on Oprah Winfrey. It's this sort of um, having no thought in your mind as you perform. He, he's really chasing that uh, in, a, in, a, in an aggressive way. You know, mm. Miles Davis isn't a nice being all the time. I'm sure he, has, he, he could be both. Um, and what's interesting about that, it kind of goes back to this idea of Logos or um genius because it's not actually about the object itself that you're viewing it's about the mind you have when you view the object right so from you know miles davis could be um a total musical genius that was able to manifest the divine creation of the universe in the present moment to an audience of hundreds of thousands of people at the same time he's just a guy that you know played the trumpet and beat up his wife right yeah both are actually completely accurate. So yeah, um, it depends what mind you're viewing 
that event with um and and that's like a creepy thing that you get from playing music is that I mean, Stockhausen researched this a lot with his, um, I guess the best called disciples. <laughs> but he, he tried these experiments of improvisation, of creating, you know, he would tell his musicians, you know, you must have no thought in your mind. They found this very difficult, you know, um, how can I not think? What do you mean not to think? So he had to like try and train people to have no mind to see what, what music would come out if he did that. Yeah, uh, and that's like the the big the big thing in 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 music, and you know, all great music normally comes from this place. It's why musicians end up taking loads of acid or drugs. Or, you know, I mean, I, th I think that's a big thing in early jazz. Like, you no, know, in nineteen twenty three to nineteen twenty six, you have George Russell, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Stockhausen, all born within that period. And they go on these tangents of researching creation in music and creation in art. Um, and they do come to some conclusions, but they're difficult to, difficult to understand. You know? Yeah. Yeah, man, man. So much of what you're saying right now is just, it's really touching a nerve with me because um, a good nerve, because I've had, literally within the past two weeks, I've been having all these questions. Like mm. how does the philosophy of ancient Greek relate to our modern music system in Western culture? You know, uh, what, what it does it mean that you have somebody like Miles Davis dealing with, you know, people like Charlie Parker, like how do you, how do you reconcile classical music versus, you know, all these philosophical questions that you're talking about. Um, can, can, can I um, be so rude as to ask you to, after the interview, to put together like a book list for me? <laughs> of, <laughs> yeah. For sure. If you can tell yeah. me all the books that you've read, because honestly, this sort of stuff has been stuff that I've been really thinking I'd love to get my head around. Yeah. Um, cause, I mean, I don't, yeah. I haven't read many books at all on music. I've, I've you've glanced... read way more than me. So <laughs> yeah, well, I just glance at them and then I try and uh, figure out, you know what, what the what the method is because most of this stuff and i think it's similar in religion and philosophy is that most of the things that we're kind of looking at as like ultimate truths they're, they're just methods so in music you'll have like you know the classical harmonic method and people will turn that into an ideology and they'll get on youtube and they'll start arguing about you know what the correct um name for a particular baroque mode is in paris in 1650 or whatever yeah and it's ridiculous because these things are just lego instruction manuals right it, it, you follow them and they all create a particular sound a particular kind of music if you study bark theory which is written much later after bark is dead way way later and you'll create something that sounds a bit like bark if you learn jazz theory you'll be able to make something that kind of sounds like a jazzy version of stevie wonder maybe i don't know uh, but they're, they're not really trying to get a, a philosophical truth in that they're just demonstrating a method to making a particular way of a particular sound in music it's what mm. film composers are, are very deft at is that you can play them pretty much anything and they will just they will create some um, almost carbon copy of it. You know, it's, yeah. it's an incredible skill. Mm. Yeah, man. Well, I, you know, whatever, whatever books you recommend to me, I'll, <laughs> I'll be focusing sure. on them over the next probably 10 years. Um, Cause that's, that's a direction I want to go down. Um, particularly the philosophical implications and uh, you know, cause you know, I think in philosophy, even in stoicism, particularly, you know, I'm kind of involved in the, the, obviously the stoic side of things and the stoics didn't particularly have a good view of musicians, you know? And, mm. and I think that um, that's something that we need to bring back into the fold in, in these modern contexts, because um, it just doesn't do the problem justice. It doesn't do the problem of music justice to just say, well, you know, like, like all of the old philosophers did, you know, like you were saying before, so, so many great quotes from like so many great smack talk quotes from those great philosophers who would say, you know, you, you silly musicians, you've brought your instruments in tune, but you have not yet tuned your mind. You know, you know it's like yeah, 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 yeah. all those classic quotes. But um, uh, now you never told me 
why the scale starts on C? Oh, um, you know what? I never really found the answer. I, I got as far as, I think I got as far as Bertius, basically. It, it, do you know what? It's just like, it's just a hack. It's a bizarre, long <laughs> hack. Um, and ultimately, the, the whole story concludes in Norwich in England um, with uh, a woman called Sarah Ann Glover around the turn of the century. And she wrote a book. I think, I think she might be actually the composer of Doa Deer, A Female Deer, Ray. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so we have this system, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. I mean, like... All of that, like the reason it's do, I think originally it was ut or something. It was changed to do because um, some guy uh, who was like working for the Pope a couple of hundred years ago wanted his name in the scale and he convinced the Pope that do represented Domini, so it meant God, but it wasn't, oh, yeah. it was actually his own name. And, and so you kind of follow it back and you're like, okay, this is pretty bizarre. So, you know, and then you find that like the scales only have six notes for quite a long time. You have this guy Guido Durezzo who created the Hand of Guido, which was about trying to find a system of making sure everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet before they've even written music. I mean, it's a fascinating research thing, but uh, it's just, again, it just goes back to that thing of like dominant systems, right? Um, and there is like opportunities at the uh, uh, in the beginning of this century. The like like you know keep banging on about him, but Stockhausen, um, he within the work of like I think they call it the Second Viennese School. It's like tonal freedom, and it's about point music. These kind of stars of sound. Like it's really powerful way of viewing sound and music. And it what happened is instead of that really taking off like music kind of descended back into classicism and mm. um and this system of like yeah the cd fgt it always it just irritates me that it's not in alphabetical order I'd, yeah <laughs> but then what's interesting is if you do put it in in alphabetical order you can come up with your own system and you know it doesn't really make any difference how how mm. you choose to approach it i mean this is the whole you know, like every everyone who like touts a theory of harmony on YouTube will, will at some point have a go at George Russell, <laughs> and yeah. it's always the guy they pick on. And it's like he's like the Yoda of jazz. Do you know what I mean? The nicest human you could imagine. Uh, um, but what's funny about it is that they all just end up sounding the same. So I think the yeah. point of it is is you know what? If you're it, once you're thinking about a sound as A or B or you've given it any, any name, you know, hyper mixolydian, Locrian, sharp five, musicians like these incredibly complicated nomenclature, doesn't change the sound that's being produced. So yeah. you have this error where you're, you're kind of being trained to look at the finger and not what the finger is pointing towards. And mm. like a, lot, a lot of musical training is getting your head out of that you know um and i think that's the same with i would argue with philosophy as well that you at a certain point you need to step back from it and i I always get this there's this quote right bertrand russell uh, and i love this quote because i got it completely wrong this is not the sentiment that he meant at all Mm -hmm. just i just learned it wrong but i think my (laughs) version's better (laughs) and he said um the greatest the greatest obstacle to philosophical truth and understanding is our own obstinate addiction to the use of language in our personal thoughts Mm. and it's you know and I think this is the plate of thing, right? At a certain point, he abandons using language for trying to get more understanding of the universe because it, it obviously it will become a limitation at a certain point. You can't you can't get there with words. You have to stop thinking, and that is pretty much uh, that's a principle of every philosophy that I've ever read. I mean, in Christianity, it's a bit rarer to find it, but in like the occult Christianities, Rudolf Stein and all of that stuff, um, everyone at a certain point says, so, and do it for a long period of time. And um, mm. that's the, one of the only things that they, they all agree on, you know. 
and yeah, and yeah. So. yeah, man, I think that's 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 really profound stuff, um, and I couldn't agree more with you on that. Well, firstly, one thing you said there is probably one of the most profound things I've heard on this podcast so far, which is that we've been, <laughs> we, we've been taught to look at the finger, not what it's pointing towards. That's deep, right? That's that sort of stuff. <laughs> That'll make you think, but you know, like I, I want to second what you're saying about um, pause to actually think about it. I've told so many of my clients who I coach, like sometimes put down the book, just focus on paying attention to how you feel and how you experience mm. things, right? Put down the, yeah, stop, stop reading so much. All of the Stoics at some point or another said, throw away your books. Marcus Aurelius said, throw the books away, right? It's, yeah, yeah. it's an external, you don't need, you can, you can understand, right? Um, you know, before, before 2020, man, I, I had recorded, you know, 250 episodes on this podcast, speaking heaps, talking, talking, talking. And then when I quit my job at the end of last year, I thought, cool, next year, I'm going to have so much to say. I'm going to do so like, it's going to be awesome. I've recorded two podcasts on my own this year. The rest of them have been interviews. I, wow. I really have been struggling with thinking of what to say because I've really started to think deeper about the, I know this, this sounds so egotistical. I don't want to say I've started mm. to think deeper about this philosophy because that just sounds stupid, but, but I've, I've had that moment of like struggling with, Oh gosh, like what is there to say? Like, I don't mm. know anything uh, when you really understand that you don't know anything and that, that it's completely un like outside of your realm of perception um, to, to, to know so much about what everything is. Um, it's kind of a horrifying experience, right? <laughs> and that's, that's what's so beautiful about music is you don't need to say anything. It's just, sure. Let's play something, you know, let, let's see yeah. what comes out. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I, I think that, uh, I mean, it's it's obviously so wonderful to to see these amazing philosophers throughout mm. history and academics and music and uh, you know, like who doesn't like listening to Zizek, right? It's it's, it's fantastic. But then, uh, you know, it's difficult to understand what what they're talking about sometimes as a lay person, which I am, and it, it does draw you to things like like Ramana Maharshi or something where it is actually quite a grim truth that once you've, you know, say, say for example, I'm playing my drums. Okay. I'll switch all the lights off and I'm ultimately the goal of the exercise is that I'm going to try and be patient and wait until I'm not really playing. So I'm just observing as the sounds are coming out. Um, and then at a certain point, what I'm going to have to do is be mindful not to think. And that creates more thoughts. So you go yeah. through that period for a little bit. And then you'll get to this thought of like, okay, well, if I'm not the thoughts, who am I? And then what is asking the question If who am I? What is observing what? And it's like an onion. It just sort of keeps going and going and going. And then at yeah. a certain point, you will be just in that moment uh, you're not remembering, you're not projecting into the future. You're not, you, it's just, it's just sort of, you, you're ob observing it in a, in a way. I guess you, you might imagine that quite a primitive animal experiences the world, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. And then it will just keep on going and going. And you do end up with this, what ultimately like, what is the I like what yeah. is saying I or all the time, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many times I've said I in the, this conversation, but what is that? You know, where mm. where is it? And uh, yeah, and that's, I don't know if that is philosophy. I don't know if it's related to psychoanalysis. I don't know, you know, I, I really don't have an answer it, to that. It is. It's, it's related to all of these things. It, re it reminds me of something that Alan Watts said. He said, like, when you're, when you're trying to look for your higher self, um, what you realize that is it, it's kind of like when the police run into a building looking for the perpetrator, the, the police run into the first story, the perpetrator runs to the second story. They run to the second story, he runs to the third story, yeah. right? And, and, and what you realize is that 
um, it, there's also another great story, which is of this, <laughs> this Buddha or, or this guru, this, this student goes to the guru and says, uh, guru, I, I struggle because I desire too much. And the guru says, well, go away for a while and try to not desire. He says, great. That's the solution. He goes away for a couple of weeks, comes back. Guru, I, I have done well. I'm not desiring anymore, but there's one problem. I still desire not to desire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, well, go away and desire to not desire to not desire. And then he just realizes that you can't do that. And that's, that's yeah. a horrifying thought, but it's also a liberating thought, right? It's like, sure. okay, take a deep breath. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. all these desires, all of these stupid thoughts, all this irrationality, all this illogical living. It's just what we are. It's just who we are. Like, and it's Indeed, okay. It's, yeah. I love, I mean, I love Alan Watts. I love how eloquently he can describe these things. Uh, my yeah. favorite Alan Watts is like, understanding the self is like trying to bite your own teeth yeah <laughs> yeah um, exactly yeah yeah it's it's <laughs> alan watts is fantastic it, it crushes you and it liberates you at the same time that yeah, is, yeah. is the way that i kind of think about it um and i think it's important to have those kinds of thoughts because so much of our lives are just spent running around trying to you know catch our own tail and um true and it's it's, it's always the like you know, consistently avoided fundamental question at the heart of all philosophy, but it's the origin of it all. Like, you know, Pythagoras isn't going to be spending his time messing around with strings if he wasn't trying to figure out what happens when he dies. Yeah. You know, it, start, it starts with the question of death and then becomes more complicated. I don't think you, it's like reductive back to the, to that in, but that's yeah. the, the one that we're always like, we shelter ourselves from any thought of tackling that, that big question yeah. you know so i like a lot of you know one of my favorite place i went um in japan there's a, a a place called kamakura which is has all these te- buddhist temples and temples uh, and I, I love the place these temples are just beautiful there's so so many shit. like just just gorgeous careful um creative little corners in these temples tiny buddhas and beautiful plants and i was care and then one day with my wife went to go to the zen temple and i was super excited like oh, i wonder what the zen temple is like we went and it was a gate and a path and a grave <laughs> <laughs> guys this is just perfect is yeah okay um and it, yeah it's like that that whole philosophy just has this like just get get to the point now you know you don't know yeah. you might get run over by a bus tomorrow so like yeah tackle this question immediately um of course we don't we don't <laughs> yeah yeah we, we we spend most of our <laughs> lives trying to avoid that question you know it's like a kid exactly. asks you hey what is death you're like uh it's too big of a question <laughs> you know yeah. wait till you're older but then they never ask it again you know i i really yeah i have found um i've found that this year i one thing that i did change which relates to what you're, you're saying there one thing that i really changed about the way that i looked at philosophy was there's kind of three elements of life that they're trying to figure out. They're trying to figure out the physics. They're trying to figure out the ethics and the logic. Sure. I, I, through one, I can't remember who pointed this idea out to me, but they said something about, um, something about Plato and um, starting with the biggest question as opposed to starting with like, okay, what am I? It's like, okay, what is everything? And then you work your sure. way up from there. Thinking about it like that, I think is what led me to that kind of moment of, oh crap, I don't know anything, right? Because w- once you realize that your your DNA goes right back to the start of everything, you know, you're you're not just you, you're like, like Alan Watts said, you didn't come into this world, you came out from it, out <laughs> like, uh, you know? Yeah. Um, and when you think about it in that kind of reversed order, which should be the correct order, um, that really makes you think about God. That really makes you think yeah. about everything, um, which is is it's an interesting place to be, you know, but listen, um, I only have one more question for you. Um, cause cause this has just been, this has been so much fun and I want to have you back Mm. more times cause, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This has been one of the the coolest conversations I've had because, because it's having a philosophical question with somebody who also is in the game that I'm in, you know, the, the game of music, which is, it's a different kind of level of, of, um, of beauty what's going on here. But when you listen to music, what are you listening for if you are listening for anything? 
Mm. Yeah, uh, it's a good one. So, the, you know, the thing that I like about music is um, it is feeling, um, and and I, I appreciate music in all different ways. And, um, but yeah, the thing that just personally for me is like is is feeling. I, I, that's all I can really think. I've always had a feeling led interest in music. I've never been that particularly interested in uh, having like massive amounts of technical ability or, you know, conceiving, uh, you know, Zanarkis style com- complicated structures. I love all of that. But yeah, it, it's just feeling. Um, and I, I guess more than feelings, they're like psychological states of mind. And yeah. for some reason, I'm pretty sensitive to them. Like, you know, within a second of listening to a piece of music, it will totally change the way I'm feeling and thinking in my mind. So, yeah, that that's basically all, all it is. And then, yeah, I love so much different music from that perspective. Um, because I'm not really trying to pin an ideology on any of it. And yeah. not, not really, if I'm honest, I'm not really that interested in the technical side of, yeah. uh, of it. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, for me, it's just it's a feeling, a feeling thing. Yeah, man. And um, I guess final question is, uh, uh, where do you see, um, what, what do you see that's exciting on the horizon for Go Go Penguin? What are you guys up to? Uh, I know we're just getting out of COVID, which is crazy. Um, but oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, what are you most excited about? Well, I, you know what? I guess hopefully there's some way of, of, of finding a way around the current global crisis. Yeah, because we we're, we're obviously we're not going to be doing very much at all um, for the foreseeable future. Hopefully next year. Um, so yeah, there's basically nothing happening until next year. Um, you know, and yeah, maybe like, uh, maybe we can find some more efficient glo- global system of managing our population so that we can deal with these crises in a more efficient manner. Yeah. Uh, Cause I think that, that certainly revealed the the flaws in, in our current system. You know, I read recently that, um, is it Jeff Bezos has now broken the record of the most amount of money earned in one day. Um, yeah. Meanwhile, Britain has uh, just, uh, well, I think we've got the world record for the biggest economic collapse. <laughs> yeah. um, which isn't really funny when you think about it. So, um yeah we're on hold along with everyone else and we're trying to do what we can to help each other out and yeah it's out of our hands to really deal with this situation sadly yeah man yeah it's it's a crazy time but um you know while everybody's at home while everybody's uh you know keeping safe please please do yourself a favor and jump on, you know, Apple music, Spotify, whatever it is, uh, you know, go to, to go, go penguin website, wherever you get it, just check these guys out. Hey, cause um, man, your music is awesome. Um, you Thank know, you. after getting Thank to know you. you in this interview, uh, I'm even more excited for you and the band. I'm going to be watching you very closely cause um, you know, not only are you a brilliant musician, you're a deep thinker. Um, you've taught me so much and you've really changed the direction of where I want to go now. <laughs> you're making me think about things. So um, thank, you, thank you and uh, and hopefully yeah. we can talk again soon. Nice one. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, Or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one together with my alignment coaching, based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time.